<laughs> okay, so um, yes, I'm, I I have, have the honor to um, welcome you all to the first ArangoDB meetup. Uh, so some of you know us, know us for a long time. So we hosted uh, a few years ago the NoSQL user group in um, our rooms. Um, either here or in the Brüsselstraße. Um, and we uh, also had a few conferences dedicated to NoSQL. Um, and we obviously did talks about Orange DB on these um, conferences and user groups and also on the Kubernetes user group. But this is now the first official uh, meetup dedicated to Orange DB. Uh, so therefore, I say it's my pleasure. But I must say that. Uh, the real things should go to Bertha and Jan because they prepared everything and uh, they all the um, nice stuff uh, around here. Uh, so I, I basically, um, yeah, I feel that Jan should have done with the opening, but he didn't want to do it. Um, so, yeah, so, so ArangoDB itself is an open source product. Um, I, I try to be brief and when we go to interesting stuff. Um, it's an open source product. There's a company now behind it, um, which is called Arangu GmbH. Um, and since last year, our headquarters is actually in San Francisco. So we are a US company and the GmbH is just a subsidiary of um, the um, so the company is dedicated to, to develop the um, database um, to give um, basically uh, support and trainings to, to companies who are interested in using ArmoDB. Um, and our mission is to improve the productivity of every developer on Earth. And um, that is a bold statement, I know, uh, but I'm pretty sure that Michael will convince you that this is true with his talk. Um, and I must say, um, it also is related to avocados, not just ArangoDB. Um, and now people who are new to uh, ArangoDB might say, why is he talking about avocados and why is the database not called avocados? Um, not to, um, uh, so if you, if you want to know that and don't know that, just talk to me afterwards. It's, it's a long story and I know that half of you might know it, so I will not tell it now. Um, but uh, but the, there, there is a story to it, and it's language. Um, yeah, okay, so what we are saying is that basically ArangoDB can do a lot of things that um, graphs and document stores can do. Um, so it's the best of both worlds, um, and therefore it has a lot of possible use cases in, in various areas of um, uh, of computing, and, and we do have customers in all of these um, this, this topics. Um, so I still have three minutes um, official time. Uh, so let's go for the, the roadmap um, to give you an overview of about what we are currently doing and what we plan to do in the future. Um, so our uh, so when, when did we do yeah, when did we switch to Roxy? Well, when was the first this was Roxy two release in November, November. So yeah, so last year um, we added we added a second storage engine. Um, so you might have heard of RoxDB, which is a storage engine provided by Facebook. Basically, Facebook is the largest user of MySQL. Um, and obviously it's very important for them to get a fast and a reliable implementation of MySQL, so they decided to um, to get a new storage engine for MySQL, namely RocksDB. Uh, but they did it in a way that is uh, that it is possible to use RocksDB also in other products like ArangoDB or MongoDB or whatever. So um, and um, as, as developing a storage engine is not a trivial task, um, and we started with memory mapped files, which have advantages, but un unfortunately also disadvantages. Um, we found it a good complement um, to use RoxDB, so we have different use cases that we can now serve. 
Um, some might uh, be better with, with MM files, some might be better with RoxyB. Um, but RoxyB is, is quite new and we are still improving um, the performance of, of RoxyB. So for, for example, um, the next um, release will contain a few improvements that make RoxyB in certain use cases four times faster. Uh, that does not mean that, that RoxyB is, is slow per se. RoxyB is really um, a good engine um, which can handle a lot of data. I mean, it was optimized by Facebook to, um, to handle a lot of data. Um, and um, we are just not finished with, with doing all the optimizations we can do. Um, so for other things we are working on is um, operational improvements. Um, so that are basically things that help you um, use ARMODB in production. So for, for instance, um, it's quite easy to use um, Arango dump, which is available right now, um, to dump your data, create a backup, um, make uh, migrations to, let's say, a um, newer version, or to, to dump data and put it into a test system and things like that. Uh, but if you have a very large data set, um, because currently Arango dump is single-threaded or Arango restore, um, it will take time. So we are, we are trying to parallelize that. Uh, so that it will be much um, faster. Um, so also, AQL, and now, if you are new to ARANGODB, I uh, uh, ask you to wait until you see Michael's talk, but basically that's our query language. Um, it is quite powerful, uh, and we try to not restrict its usage. Uh, that has, unfortunately, the side effect that if you are new to it, um, you might run into unexpected issues with performance because um, basically you could, in principle, um, do something like a Cartesian product quite easily. Um, the SQL <coughs> people are trained to recognize such, such queries, but um, as we have three data models we want to support um, natively, um, in, in one theory language, it's um, getting a bit more complicated than, than SQL. Um, it's easy to learn, but it's also um, not as easy to, to profile it. So we are adding profiling and debugging um, support to, to our AQL um, system. Um, so what's else on the roadmap? So for cluster optimizations, um, basically uh, we are trying to so, so we have two modes of operation. So we have a single server setup where you can have just one server, keeping everything in that server, and that's quite often enough if you, um, if you have a large machine that could be uh, well enough for you, but if you have really large data, you might want to go to cluster. And, um, it's inherently um, more complicated to do queries in a, in a cluster. So um, for instance, distributed graph algorithms, um, no graph database has solved that problem. Um, but we are trying to um, do as much optimizations as possible so that uh, it's, the performance of a cluster will be comparable to things. Um, we also are adding new geo functionality. Some of you might remember um, Richard Parker's talk about Hilbert curves. Um, and we, but we, we now decided to go um, to a library that is called S2 Geometry. That's a library um, Google has developed, which is also um, quite fast and more flexible because it allows uh, much more you know, geometric uh, shapes than, than our implementation. Um, the largest news feature we are currently working on is Rango Search. And that is a feature that allows you to do full text on documents that are in your documents, so to say, store of ArangoDB. Um, so currently Arango supports some basic functionality to do full text search, uh, but that is not as sophisticated as, let's say, Lucene or um, Elastic. And we do have, um, we are now using a C++ library. I mean, you can ask why don't you just use Lucene? <coughs> Um, the problem is that, that we are C++ and Lucene is Java, and it's hard to marry these two languages together. I mean, it is possible, uh, but it's not easily done. And uh, lucky for us, um, Dell uh, EMC has created a C++ library 
uh, that is capable of doing all these fancy um, stuffs, including um, in the future, hopefully, some, uh, let's say, um, AI searches um, uh, that we can use. And because it's C++, it is possible to integrate that into our um, So a first version is available, so you can test that. And we would love to get feedback on that, because Obviously, um, if you have a library, then, then you have to decide which functions you want to support in which way. Uh, so we created something which we, which we believe is usable and feasible and easy to handle. Uh, but getting feedback on, on new stuff is always uh, paramount because um, yeah, you might have a completely different use case in mind and um, that will happen. <coughs> so if you... I mean, I know that at least someone was here three years ago. Um, there is some more development, which is not in that slide during the last years. It's basically um, everything around starting a, um, starting a single server is just a click on the terminal. Um, but um, starting a cluster used to be quite complicated. Um, but we now have something called the starter. Um, and that program is... Um, taking all the burden away from you. So, so if you have the starter, it will uh, allow you to, with the three command lines on three different servers, uh, start an Arango cluster with all the necessary setup done automatically. Um, and we have a first integration into Kubernetes. Uh, you might remember that we started with um, DCUS, Mesosphere Apache, uh, Mesos um, as our it's a distributed uh, environment, and um, we now also have a Kubernetes um, operator that allows you to start a yeah, Kubernetes with, I forget the command, cube control, something, and that's a good start. Okay, that was basically my introduction, and uh, now to the real stuff, namely avocados. Um, and I give to the microphone to Michael and hope you enjoy your evening. Yes, so thank you very much, Mike. Also for me. Oh, I should not start with this slide. <laughs> <laughs> this I've got fast. a question. <laughs> <laughs> What's this talk about? <laughs> Well, it was all obvious, so I just skipped it. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much, Frank, for this uh, nice introduction and the future of ArangoDB. Now I will talk a bit about the state of the art. What are we doing right now? What is our position in the market? What can we do? And I will focus on the multimodal aspect of ArangoDB. Also, for me, it's a pleasure to talk on the first ever ArangoDB meetup. So I hope you will enjoy this evening. Let's get started. So, title of the talk, the multimodal database movement, especially with a focus on Arango. So, we all know these kind of diagrams from the relational area. So, the single model area where we had one type of databases a couple of years ago, and all our data that we had in our application, we tried to force it into one data store, always using the same relational schema because it was the only option available. So there were some competitors, but they were never popular. And it kind of works, but they have some kind of drawbacks because of the initial design. So most relational databases were designed when you had really low amount of main memory, really low amount of hard disk drive. So they were optimized to not store any bit redundantly. You're trying to normalize as much as possible and then join together on runtime. This has some drawbacks uh, in terms of performance. It has good points because everything is pretty compact. And it works with few main memory. And another major problem of most of these products is they don't scale to multiple machines. So they're typically bound to one machine. <coughs> A lot of those implementations keep up with the NoSQL area and edge features like sharding and so on. So we are getting closer together in the client. Nevertheless, for a lot of data models that you have in your application, forcing them into a relational format is not the best way to do it. There are other options that 
would be better for your application data format. And that is where the multimodal error or the NoSQL area begins. And I would like to talk about three major data models there. There are a couple of more outside, but I would like to cover only these three. The first key value, it's pretty much the easiest database you can think of because it stores a key that you can define and attaches any kind of value to it. And the database itself initially doesn't know anything about this value. You can store a JSON there, you can store some PDF there, you can store whatever you like, the database doesn't care. That has the side effect that you cannot query for anything inside the value. You can only query by key. The advantage of this data model is it's super fast. It's super easy to scale, but it has its limitations. So those were these high scaling data stores that we were using out in the fields. <clears throat> Next, a bit more complex, JSON document stores. Typically, they are based on some kind of key value store because they still have a primary key <coughs> and they map this key typically to a JSON document or some other attribute structure document format. In most cases that I know of, it's JSON because JSON is a common format, common format nowadays. Typically, they group documents in collections, like you may know from relational tables. So logically, <coughs> similar documents inside the same collection. Let's say you have a product collection. All your products are stored inside this one thing. And these kind of data stores allow you to index some attributes of these documents, search for them, filter for them, query them, and by using the indexes, get those queries fast. If you would like to do some kind of indexing on a key value store, that means you would need to write a new key and let it point to the same value or let it point to the original key and thereby do a two-step lookup to find the original data. For JSON document store, you can just store the document once, you find an additional index and the database will find it. Typically, those stores have some kind of query language, making it a bit harder to distribute because as soon as you can query a lot of documents at the same time from different machines, you will add probably some more network overhead, which slows the system down. And initially, <coughs> most document stores said, we don't want to slow the system down. We want to make sure that you cannot combine those documents in an arbitrary way. Thereby, most of them didn't support joins at all. So you can only query documents with some kind of MapReduce, ask all service, and in one go get all the data back. And if you need something more, please ask again. The third data model I would like to cover is the graph databases. And they go in a completely different direction. <laughs> so the first data models go for scaling, go for performance. The graph goes for complexity. Typically, they store vertices and edges. And their main focus is many to many relations between those vertices. So in a graph document, the vertex is the data record in a table, and an edge is like some many-to-many -many relation between any arbitrary amount of vertices. So they get away with, the, with removing the limit that you have to define, oh, I can only connect persons to products. If you like, you can add an edge between a person and a product in the other direction from a product to a person, from a person to a person, the database allows all of that without changing the schema. Typically, vertices and edges have attributes, and they can be indexed. And the main focus or their like, point where they shine is if you query alongside the paths, so following the edges pointing together those vertices. Especially if you're using variable length or pattern length. So you say, I started at a certain person, please give me all the second step friends, and third step friends, and fourth step friends, and five step friends. In the graph database, one line of query, and off you go. Relational world would end up with a couple of joins that you would have to add. And one major use case for graph databases is also search for, for patterns, so pattern matching. Where you define a sub part of your graph. So you say, I have a user which is logged in, so I know this user, this user has a product, 
and I want to know um, who other people have bought the same product, what have they bought. Simple recommendation engine, kind of. So I have defined this pattern containing four vertices and how they are connected. And the graph database can search for all parts stored in there matching this pattern. <laughs> However, as they are focused on many-to-many -many relations, that means they have to combine lots and lots of documents for one queue. And therefore, graph databases typically are very, very hard to scale. And most competitors don't even scale at all. They say, we have a hard requirement that the entire graph has to fit on every machine, period. For RainyDB, we are able to shard graphs um, and try to get out um, a reasonably good performance there. <clears throat> I would like to talk you to the whole movement and how it changed all the things with a little use case. And my use case is the avocado company. So we have a company that grows avocados on farm, harvests them, and sales them. And in this company, we have a couple of several teams. We have the team Clifton, Gordo, Orko, and Reed. Those are four types of avocados. And these teams all have their own area and they are planting and harvesting these types of avocados. And if you look to the wall on the right, those are the teams. <laughs> <laughs> Next team, team marketing. So their job is it to make the avocados that the first team creates even more shiny and tasty before they go to market. <laughs> then we have team bacon and their job is to maintain the heavy farming equipment everything that we have standing here at the office. We have team support, so they assure the quality of the products, and as soon as we have ripened avocados, they're gonna help the customers to, to keep the quality of the avocado. <clears throat> of course, we have a sales team. Their job is to bring the best avocados to the market. And finally, we have the management team. They all do the hard core decisions and keep the company running so that everyone can do their work. But of course, each team has its own territory and access to tools or farming land. And we need to make sure that these teams don't steal from each other so that not one team gets all the resources and the other ones can't work. So we have some kind of access pattern that we need. If we now want to store this whole structure of the company that we have in there inside the databases, let's take a look at the database formats. Of course, we can somehow force it in a relational model, which in this case is actually quite easy. So what you can see in the center is we have a couple of employees. All of the employees are part of teams, and we can have teams inside teams, inside other teams, and uh, most of them in arbitrary combination. On the left-hand side, we have all these scarce resources. We have machines, we have depots we have, which we fill up, and we have fields which we have to share to plant our avocados into. And on the left-hand side, you see that all of them have many-to-many -many relations. <clears throat> Whereas the fields, the depots, and the machines are quite easy themselves. On the right-hand side, we have the sales side. So we have customers, and of course, we didn't try to close deals with our customers. And for customers, we have some kind of contact information or ship addresses and email contacts and whatever we want to store there. Quite simply, um, yeah, parts by themselves. <clears throat> but we need to denormalize the customers because one customer can have multiple addresses, even different address formats, which I haven't shown here at all. We can have different type of contacts, so <clears throat> we need to do some one-to-many um, relation for these kinds of things. Of course, all of that works. We can create a data model like this. But the simple query is already quite hard. If I have a given team, what are the members of this team? And it is hard because of this loop. One team can be part of arbitrary other teams. So I don't know how deep this tree will be nested. And I cannot really easily write a SQL query, a classical SQL query, that traverses the way all down so that I can find the employees. 
and the part on the left is also quite hard to figure out. <coughs> so let's first divide that into these three different parts. So we have the machines that depose the fields on the left hand side with their access patterns, the team structure in the center, and the sales part on the right. Now, let's go to a different data. <coughs> Something that uh, Martin Fowler has named polyglot persistence. Polyglot persistence, or one point of polyglot persistence, is that you try to isolate all the data models that you have and try to pick the right tool for the job or the right data model for the job. And we now have split everything in the same way. <coughs> I have not yet modeled the access pattern here. But what we see on the left hand side, the farm resources, we have depots, we have machines, we have fields, all of them quite simple. In the center, we have the theme structure, and on the right, we have the sales information. And now, <coughs> for my types of queries that I want to, to execute, on the left hand side, I typically need one of these entries, or maybe need an aggregation across all of them. So, for example, I want to know how many avocados we are right now growing over the fields. In the center, I have kind of a tree or a graph-like structure. And on the right, in my query opinion, or for our sales, we typically have like one sale information and we want to access everything for this sale only by a single ID. Or we have a customer ID and we want to co collect all the customer information at one go. And if we have this isolated like this, we can pick different data models for all of them. So in the center is quite obvious. I have a graph, so I take a graph database for this, for this kind of things. On the left hand side, I find, I'm fine with the JSON document store because I only need some aggregation across the same level. Um, maybe I even get around with not using any joints at all. Um, I get into trouble with the access management. And on the right hand side, as I only need to look by some IDs, some concatenated value, I'm fine with the key value scheme. And now I can set up the same thing using any database vendor for one of these three data models and get that all up and running. <coughs> if I would now have to implement the access control, I need to duplicate some data to some of the resources. So either I can add for the JSON documents store the team name or the employee name that has access to this or that data. <coughs> and if I need to find that out, I need to check in the documents store. Or if I want to store it in the graph database because it's easy to get a query there, I need to replicate the IDs of my resources into the graph database to figure out who can access what part. And the same was true for the customer information on the right hand side. Um, for the right hand side, I would typically pull it into the graph database. But now let's take a look at the multi-model database. And multi-model database like ArrangeDB can actually serve multiple data models with just one solution. <coughs> so we pick the same data models, but we just put it in one database. One technology involved, and we can cover all three of them. Doesn't mean it has to be a single instance. So if we want to, for some reason, make sure that they are separate on different instances, we can do. But we only have one of those um, uh, one of those services. So, what are the benefits and what is the overhead of using a polyglot setup in total? I'm not talking about multiple databases yet. So, one of the benefits is I have a natural mapping of my application data into the data. If in my application I'm typically throwing around JSON documents, it's super easy to just take it and store it in a JSON document store. I don't have to think about it. It just works. If I have a super complex graph in my application, I need to search several patterns, graph database is natural. <clears throat> and if I really just need to key value lookup, I don't need to have all the overhead of defining a schema for a rational database. I'm fine with the key value store there and just want to scale it out, get speed. I don't want, I just want to get rid of all the overhead. Of course, the database is optimized for this specific format. 
So they know which format they get and they know how to get the maximum out of it. You get queries specific for this data format, of course. So main benefit is that you can focus on writing your business logic and don't have to focus on creating a super complicated schema beforehand and then make sure that your business logic kind of maps into that. All comes for a price. Typically you have data redundancy. If you have to implement this access patterns, you have to share some data between different database systems. And to my best knowledge, there's no tool out there that does it automatically for you. So you have to kind of implement it yourself. And of course you end up with all kinds of syncing issues. So what if the, if the graph database fails and there is some synchronization to the document store ongoing, how can you get that back up and running? So if the document store continues for a couple of while, then the graph database comes up again and it's out of sync. Next important thing is you have several technologies involved. Of course, you need to learn and master <coughs> more technologies, which is time consuming. All of them, they don't stand still, they all do updates. So it's kind of an effort to get them all updated from time to time. Or you end up with super old, maybe unsupported versions from the database vendors. <laughs> and having all of that is a, is a huge administration effort. So someone has to make sure that all of them is up and running and all of them are configured right. And of course, we know that no, no software out there is bug free. All of them have different bugs and you have to work with them. And now comes one of the major points that I like about the multi-model improvement. You can combine those data points. So we have now clearly separated them but with the multi-model database, we have the option to just combine them back again. So we have graph in the center, and we need some access control to the key-value store. So we just combine the graph data with the key-value data by adding edges between them. And the same we do on the left-hand side. We combine the graph data again with the document data. And thereby our complete access pattern can be implemented inside the graph and they physically point to the same data. And that completely crosses out the syncing problem. It's just one technology, it keeps all its data in sync itself. I don't have to do anything as an application developer for it. And this leads me to a feature list of ArangoDB. So ArangoDB is a, what we like to call native multi-model database. That means we have one core that supports all the data models. And we don't have this layered approach where you have one layer, then the next layer, then the next layer, and then thereby everything works together or even using different technologies in between to end up with some graph database form on top. <clears throat> next thing is we have AQL. AQL is our query language, which allows for super complex queries, including joins and traversals. And it can cover all the three data models just with one language. For the single server, ArrayDB is asset, including, including multi collection transactions, just as you know from the traditional world. In the cluster, we are not quite there yet, but we are improving. We have a nice feature, which is not a database feature, per se, that is called Fox. And Fox allows you to extend the database API by writing some code. Yes, there is the Fox mask. <laughs> so by writing some code, plug it into the database, which exposes the REST API that you can make sure with your own access control or with the database access control, whichever you need for your use case. And then you just have REST endpoint to connect to the database instead of firing through the query endpoint. And of course, RangDB is scalable, so we have a cluster with multi-master and data center to data center setups. Um, could you just rewind and say that thing again about Fox? I got okay. time halfway in the sentence. I can store. It's like a, like a store procedure, or um, it's a bit more than a store procedure. So you can imagine it like a store procedure, but you have a complete REST API that you put in into the database. It manages this REST API for you, exposes it, and you are free to code anything in this REST API. So you can just store queries in there, and it would be some kind of store procedure. 
domains. So it provides the rest, the Fox provides northbound the REST API. It provides a REST API that you can define and which gets under the hood complete control of the data and runs in the database. I will have a couple of slides on it so okay, we'll sorry, sorry. sort out the details later. <coughs> Demo time. <laughs> <laughs> so I've talked a lot about uh, RangDB and how this all works. So it now it's time to prove. Hmm? What? It was about time for them. Yes. <laughs> okay. First of all, I have installed <coughs> RangDB on my, my machine. Just uh, so I have installed the Mac version over Homebrew, but I could also, like, if I'm using Linux, I could just install it with AppGet or Windows or all the distributions that we support. And now I need to start this. And I would like to start the, uh, use the starter always. I could just use a rainbow D to start it, which would be the rainbow daemon. But I prefer to use the starter, which allows to start rainbow DB in different mode. And I would like to start with a single node. So I set the starter into single. That means I get a single instance of rainbow DB, no cluster. And I can define, oh, this is the data here where everything will be written to. Now I start it. And the starter works like a supervisor. So it monitors the process. If the process, for whatever reason, crashes or gets killed or what, whatsoever happens, the starter will try to restart the server. So some kind of self-healing for a single server and more important for a cluster. Because actually, I can use the, the starter in the newest versions to do some kind of rolling upgrade. I just let, let everything run, install the new version, and then kill our processes and let the startup move the new version. <laughs> but I won't show it today. So now I have started my Rango DB. Just one click, a single command. It says me that I can use the Rango shell to connect to it, or I can use my browser. So let's start with the browser. And if I'm not mistaken, I have it somewhere. I can use this, this pick. And off we go. This is the ArrangoDB web interface. Right now, I don't have any data stored in there at all. I have a fresh database. And I have authentication disabled, which, of course, I would not do in production. Right? <clears throat> so let's get some data in. Told me that I can just use the Arango shell command which is just copy-paste of this line. So there we go. This is a Rango shell. This is for interactive shell access, where I can just check uh, whatever is stored in the, in the database. I have a JavaScript um, interpreter here now, so I can write some functions, execute JavaScript code, and basically talk to the database. And I have prepared some library that inserts all the data. I will just run it. It loads a JavaScript file executing a function and putting all the data in. So we see I have a couple of more collections now created. I will not yet go into details there. Let's go back to the web interface and reload. And there we go. We have all the collections that we need for our farming use case. So we have our customers. We have the deals, we have the posts, we have employees, and we have some relations between them. So for example, we have the is part of relation uh, that connects employees together with, uh, where are they? Teams on the bottom. Now, uh, should I increase this? Is this better? Okay. <laughs> so we have a couple of collections, and I have inserted a couple of documents in there. So let's take a look. Most of them are actually empty, that was the wrong collection. Let's go for, uh, let's say fields. So they have kind of claim uh, type and how many fruits we are growing right there. So it's not super useful data, but I, I think you get um, where it's going. I've promised you graphs. So I have created under the hood four graphs that are overlapping. The full graph includes everything that we need for our access control. Access rights will just include the access control. Then we have the company structure, which includes, okay, who's part of which team. 
And then we have the customer sales which is the right hand side connecting everything to the QA store. So let's take a look at the cost, uh, the, the structure and we're starting with the sales team. So this is random and all of these are people working inside the sales team. And let's expand the company which has different teams here. And let's go to Team Gordo, which is my team. And if we zoom in a bit, other direction, there we go. We can see that we have a couple of employees working inside the, the Gordo team. And all of them are grouped together in the farmer's team, which will connect <coughs> Team Clifton, Team uh, team Orco here and Team Reed. So this is uh, how you could, for example, explore RankDB visually, just displaying the graph structure. <clears throat> okay. Let's go back to the queries view because we will use this one in a second. Back to the slides. So what have you seen now? RankDB starting, putting some data in, so now we have some things that we can query. Let's again go through the use cases. First question, how many avocados are we growing right now across all our fields? <clears throat> we simply need to iterate over our fields. We need some aggregation query. We get away without joins. We get away without graphs. Quite simple query. So in AQL, we typically write four loops. So iterating over the fields collection in orange, executing some actual commands, so the field will be inserted into the next command for every field that we find. The next command will be executed, and then finally we will return something. Of course, all of this will be executed in batches. <laughs> Let's copy over. I cannot. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> then let's copy it over like this. <laughs> Uh, this direction. So, here here. First thing I would like to introduce to you is the explain. The explain button. Query is not correct. You're right. Thanks. Good. So it's it's always good if you have the experts in the audience. <laughs> for, for field work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. The explain will simply analyze the query, um, will try to optimize it before, but not execute the query, and will give some estimates. So, what will it actually be executing? And you get some hints okay, where will, will uh, most likely be the time spent, which indexes will be used, and so on and so on. I have not defined any indexes yet, so we cannot use any indexes for this kind of query. Um, and now let's execute it. And it says that we are running 253, uh, yeah, uh, or we are growing 253 fruits right now in all other fields. To prove that, let's just modify this query and instead return the field so that we get a list of all our six fields. So not too much, we are growing, but <laughs> not too fast. <laughs> And on the right hand side, we have fruits. And for all of you who are fast calculators, I think uh, you'll figure out that the number is correct. <laughs> Simple query. Let's go on to the next one. This direction. Um, how can I go to the next slide now? Just... Yeah. So, who is member of the farmer's team? Let's copy it over to the other interface. <clears throat> we are again starting at a team. So four team and teams, we're iterating over all our teams that we have. We filter by a given name. So a name is an attribute on the team's documents. Just to show you, How a team look like looks like. Meet team. Execute. There we go. So each team has a different name, has 
information printed to it and has the internal <coughs> on the left hand side. <coughs> so now we have at first we would like to select the farmer's team. So again, let's put the return team over here, move the no simple, move the comment below, and now we should end up at the farmer's team. Off we go, we only have a single farmer's team. Pretty straightforward, I would say. If we would have more teams with the same name, of course, we would get a list of different teams. And now we are combining this with the graph theory. So first of all, we have to define the return value of the graph theory. We want to have an employee, which is vertex. Then we have to define how many steps we want to walk. So starting at at least one step, so one edge. And we go up to 100 edges, or 1 million, whichever I would like to have there. Or I could do one or two, or I can only do one. Next, I define the direction. So from my data model, an employee has an edge pointing to the team, and another team has an edge pointing to a different team. And with my farmer's team, I don't know where I am in the tree. So what I do in my query now is I go against the direction of the edge, which is inbound. Outbound would be following the edge, and any would be don't care if the edge is inbound or outbound. I will go at any. Then I would start at the team that I have in my head, and my edge collection is called is part of, which defines the relation. <clears throat> then I add a filter. Is same collection makes sure that the document that I have in my hand now is part of the employee's collection. Because with the graph, I can connect any objects with any other objects. So it's not clear that I only find employees, especially in this graph, because I will walk over different teams in the worst case. And I don't need teams, I just want to have the employees. And then finally, I just return the employee. And off we go. We have 18 farmers working for our company, and all of them in different teams. I have not added any personal details for these employees, <laughs> as you may see. Maybe I'm also interested in the entire path, how I got there to my employees. So I can add up to three return values for traversal. So employee is the last vertex that I have in my hand. The edge is the edge that led me into this vertex, so the edge before. And the third parameter is the path, which prints the entire path that my traversal had to walk from the start point to whatever it has returned. <coughs> and if I would return, let's say, path of vertices, then I will get all the vertices on the path. The first vertex would be the start vertex, Last vertex is the target. And there we go. We have Jason formed here. So we're starting at the farmers. Then one team is the team Clifton. And Eva is one of the employees in team Clifton. <laughs> of course, we are first checking the entire team Clifton now and get all the employees in team Clifton. Again, team Clifton. Again, team Clifton. And there. One farmer is Frank. Frank is not assigned to any team because he's our CTO. He's a direct farmer. <laughs> um, then we have Team Reed, Bear and Rain for CDR, and so on and so forth. I think you get the picture. Next query. Something which I think is super complicated to formulate in a relational theory. Do I have access to a field? And access is granted if I personally have access to the field, if I am part of one team that has access to the field, or this team is part of a team that has access to the field, and so on and so on and so on. So the access is defined by is there a path, a valid path from me to the resource? And 
And what we can use there is a so-called shortest path feature that takes two arbitrary documents from somewhere, a list of edges it should follow, of course, each of them with a direction, and then can compute the shortest connection between those things. And by the design of my graph, I have made sure that I cannot like, run into endless loops, which the feature wouldn't do anyways. But that the path that I follow with the shortest path is a path that grants me the access, because I would always walk from employee up to the team. And using the same direction, I can go over to the fields. <clears throat> so again, I iterate over the employees here. I start with myself, so I know the key value here. I don't have personal details, just the key value. Then I start a subquery because I'm not interested in the path. I just want to know if there is a path. And then I do the shortest path query. Again, it has two output variables here, the vertex and the edge. And the shortest path query will return the list of all vertices. I start at myself. I go to the field that I would like to have access to. And I only need this part relation and comes on solution. And as I'm not interested in the pass at all, I'm fine if I only find a certain vertex. Because if I don't have a pass, the result of this query will be null. So I will not return anything, but it will return null instead. And as soon as I find one vertex, that means there is a path. So I can just return one, and I'm fine with checking against one. And then I say, OK, if my result of the subquery is one, then I have access, otherwise not. Execute. And it says that I don't have access to this field. Oh, <laughs> Let's go to a different field. And I have access to field six. Let's take a look at the graph here to really see, or let's maybe print the entire path to see that I get access here. So instead, let's return V, and here, for simplicity, let's return P. And of course, remove the limit. So I've just removed the limit, and I return the entire document that I find. And finally, I return the path of that. <clears throat> and it says that actually I don't have the fields stored in my data set, but never mind. So thereby the last thing is actually null, but doesn't matter. I forgot it. So, <laughs> um, I'm starting at my vertex, Michael. Michael is part of Team Goro, and Team Goro has access to this field. And thereby I have a path, and path is grant, uh, access is granted. If I would be interested in the edges as well, I can just include them. And now I see Michael. And of course, Michael is my start vertex, so I don't have an edge leading me to my start vertex. That's not. Bordo, and I can go over this part of relation from Michael to Team Bordo. And then I have Teams Bordo pointing to field number six. Uh, maybe I I used the capital F here, but never mind. I think you get the picture. Next question. Which recent deals have been closed? Of course, our sales team is quite active, and they are trying to sell as much as avocados as possible. And we simply want to aggregate, starting with a graph traversal, ending up in a couple of documents. <coughs> and then we want to, yeah, first of all, just return all of them. But also, we can combine them with an aggregation data. So the idea is pretty much the same, starting in teams, collecting the sales team. Um, we return the team. And we need to look into the edge, because we only want to have deals that we have closed this year. And we have stored some date time string. It's not the best format, but uh, anyways. What I also wanted to say is 
for traversal, I can even switch directions for each of the relations that I want to want to go. So the default will be inbound, and for is part of it, we'll be using the default. But for has closed, actually I want to go in the other direction. The reason is I start at the sales team. To get to the employees, I have to go down. But an employee has closed the deal in the other direction, so I need to switch directions. What, what this number two says in five? Yes. Ah, okay, so this is the number of steps I'm going to execute. So I know that all employees are direct part of the sales team. So one step I need from the sales team to an employee, and one step from an employee to the deal is closed. What if you don't know the number of steps you have to traverse? I can just do something like this. Or this. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it, do it doesn't matter because my, my data set is not that large. So it cannot like do this computation. Um, if I would be in a real production use case and I really don't know what my graph looks like, this is of course super dangerous because that can be super expensive. So you can use this high numbers if you know how your data is structured and you know that it will not explode at one point. And I will basically end up with the same result. <coughs> If, okay, let's say I don't know that they are part, directly part of the sales team. Um, and we will do this actually in a minute after I do the application. So, first of all, now I have a couple of deal documents in my hand. And I have started to get them with a graph query. And I can continue with the document features again. So, I can just use the collect. Okay. Aggregate sum is equal to sum of deal and it's called value. So I'm just using the document feature from the result that I got from a traverse. And okay. Okay. okay, where's with the issue? Live debugging. <laughs> Aggregate some yield of value. Ah, you see here that it estimates quite a lot because I have a large, large depth and it doesn't know how it's connected. Um, okay, never mind. I don't see the. Okay, never mind, I don't see the issue right now. Um, nevertheless, I could I could just um, do it like this. So if I return deal.value instead, maybe I'm, I'm, I made a mistake in the aggregation. Um, nevertheless. Is sum a keyword? Can you use sum as a variable? That, that may be the point, yes, you're right. Yeah, sum is a keyword. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Never. Never mind. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Everyone's life demos are always hard. Um, okay. Nevertheless, let's just return the deal again. No. And what I would like to point out as well is that I can use indexes and the query optimizer will figure out which index is useful at which point. So here we say, see in the explain that we have an enumerate collection node. Enumerate collection node means that we have to iterate through the entire collection. My collection now has 10 documents, which is not too expensive, but for having 10 million documents, it may be super expensive. So instead we should use an index instead. And as we are filtering on the name attribute, we will just create an index on them. And where's the teams? There we go. Indexes. And add a new index. In the RankDB, we have four, five different types of indexes. Geo-index, which will be upgraded in the next release. Um, we have hash index, 
hash indexes can be used for equality checks only and have constant time performance. Persistent index is stored on disk and does only matter on memory map files. Um, but is a sorted index in the same as for the skip list index. So it can be used for sortedness, for range checks, but also for equality checks. Will not be as fast as hash indexes for equality checks, obviously. And only the persistent index is persistent. Yes. Uh, in, okay, let's talk about the memory map files engine. So in memory map files, the indexes are only in memory. That means on <coughs> reboot of the system, I recompute the index. So you're not using RocksDB right now, but yes, right now I'm not using RocksDB because it's. Uh, but then they still will all be persistent. Yes, in RocksDB they are all persistent um, <coughs> because we're using RocksDB for the index storage, and we add some in-memory caches before to get the same uh, hash index. <laughs> So for, for RocksDB, the persistent index and the skip list index don't make any difference at all. But now let's take the, the skip list. Now, no. The hash index, of course, use the name. And I could actually say it's a unique index or a sparse index. Sparse means if there is some attribute in some documents that don't have this attribute, they will not be part of the index. If I don't use a sparse index, they will be indexed with the attribute equals null. And that means if my search includes null, I cannot use sparse indexes. Because the index cannot find everything that is not inside the index. It can only find parts in the index. Um, but I'm fine with the default settings. And as it is unique, the selectivity estimate is 100%, so I will always find the correct document. And if I now go back to the query and explain it again without changing, it will tell me instead that I used a hash index scan using the hash index on name. And the estimate has now gone down to one return document instead of 10 for this specific collection. It will not change the result, of course. <clears throat> and I think that's it about HTML. Okay, let's go back to presentation mode. Let's take another look at the benefits and the overhead, now taking into account the multi-mode approach. On the benefits part, it starts with the same. So we still have natural mapping of the application into the database. Every data model is still implemented. I can just use it as it is. The database has a core to compute this data model. So it's optimized, you get from specific queries, and you still focus on this approach. And now comes the new parts. As we can just reuse the data from different data formats, there is no undesired redundancy. We can use redundancy for replication, but nothing that we need on a data level just to connect everything together. We can just reuse the data from the other data formats. <coughs> You have only one technology involved, so you only have to learn or master one query language, the parameters that you need for one data store. <clears throat> and you only have to keep this one updated, so you can just update one of these processes. And another benefit is, if you are having a longer running project, and you start, let's say, with a document use case, a pure document use case, and then after half a year or a year, you figure out, oh, we need to add some social features, which typically includes a graph database. You can just do it. You can switch from the documents uh, or the data model that you have right now to a different one, or just add a new one. Because you all have that in the same technology. You don't have to start all over again. Of course, we have still some overhead or different overhead. First of all, you have more data model choices. So when starting with a new project, you're sitting there, hmm, which would be the right data model now? If you're not having, oh, we only have this one option, so we need to squeeze it into, you have to think, oh, which is the best data model? But because you can switch the data model later on, it's actually not that bad, because you're not working. If you start with the wrong data model or suboptimal data model, you can switch later, if you need to. <laughs> Another thing is you have a lot to learn for one specific database. 
Yeah, of course you have to learn three data models, but you can start with one model at a time. So if you have a document case, you don't have to care for the graph stuff. You can just focus on the document stuff and get the system up and running. And as soon as you figure out, oh, I need some graph data modeling, then maybe take a look at the graph stuff and learn a bit more. Important part, benchmark. So because Typically, you would say for a generalized database, it's quite hard to compete against a super specialized database for one data model. And we assumed the same, and we wanted to compare to our competitors, taking a look at how they perform on their turf and how we perform on their turf by using a data set that <coughs> has a couple of features for all the different data stores. Um, it is a social network, which has a couple of document use cases in it, because you can do some queries across the users, and it has a couple of graph use cases across the social relations between the users. And the first two are the most typical database queries that you use for performance. So single document lookup, single write, and you shouldn't be too slow for these. And you see that most of the databases are pretty good at those. Um, I think there is an issue with MongoDB in the current version that we tested there on the driver's site, most likely, we are not sure, um, because they were super close to us in the benchmarks before, and we don't think that their peak is, is really true. <coughs> um, then we have a single write zoom. Single write zooms means we write, and then we wait until we have a file zoom, and then let the database return. Most databases offer this feature, uh, OrientDB doesn't, and Neo4j, which is a graph database, only has this mode. So they don't have the first write to memory and say, okay, it's all good, because there is some certain period of time where the data is only in memory, and if the machine crashes in that half a second or so, the data could be lost, although you set your client up here running it. That is something you can accept, and you can, for all the set database systems, turn it on on the fly. Next query is an aggregation. So we aggregated the ages of the users. So in the profiles there were the age attribute, which is a number, and just um, counted how long we do the full table scan and sum up all, all the ages, so group them by age. And here we see that um, Postgres, using a tabular format, where you say, oh, this age attribute is a number, and it is a short number, can make use of this information because it can use a smaller data type than all the schema-free other data stores who don't enforce that there's <coughs> always a number stored in the age attribute, but they could have a string. So they are much faster there. As soon as you go to the JSON format, they are much slower because they can't make use of this information. Anymore. In total, you can see that we don't perform that bad. Typically, we are fastest in most cases. However, we have a little bit more of a memory footprint, um, which is configurable with RocksDB. But there you can say we have an upper limit of memory that we're going to use, and we might exceed that, and uh, it doesn't like kill the entire process. So the machines that we used there had enough memory for all the databases, so there was a lot of free space still on, on the machines. <coughs> Now let's talk about Fox. Fox is what we like to call a microservice framework. So a framework that allows you to micro write microservices and turn your database in kind of microservice component. So the idea is that you can add a REST API to a RenderDB. All of them is written in JavaScript. <clears throat> and you can use or reuse many Node NPM modules. Not all of them, because we are not Node. We have our own uh, V8 implementation uh, included and not Node. So there are some Node modules that don't work, especially if they use some features that only Node has implemented. If in doubt, just try it out. Plus point, you generate an interactive documentation in a spec of forms where you can just try out your microservice. What are the benefits of using FOSS? So all the operations are executed directly within the database. 
So you don't have any network traffic, especially if you have dependent queries. So let's say you have your front page and it should display 20 items for a user to buy. Then you have a super fast query that has a chance to return less than 20 items. In that case, you need to issue a longer running query. And if you can encapsulate that on the database server, you don't have one round trip in between those two queries. So maybe you desirable, maybe you want to start with a, slower, a lower amount of data, data there. But that could be one of the use cases. Even more important, complex rights management. Where you want to say, oh, I have attribute level access rights. So certain users should be allowed to see the salary, certain users don't. And if certain flag is there, said that this user should read this or that attribute, it's super complicated. If you try to configure it in a database system, you typically get insane. If you write it in code, it's just a couple of switch cases and you're done. And that's one point of Fox. You can write those switch cases implement them and then encode. And Fox makes sure that the only data matching these criteria leaves the database. But all stay inside the data store if not matching these criteria. <clears throat> what are the use cases? Microservice architectures, of course, because there's typically REST APIs that you have all around the place. <laughs> And the database is then just another storage microservice in the same area. So you don't have language, query language creeping all about your services. You just have a couple of defined endpoints. You can store different versions or use some version workflows, making it easy to handle. And of course, you can do API or data, data format migration. So you can deploy different API versions if you have the old versions running. And you can do on-the-fly document migration behind the, behind the service. So whenever you read an old document, which you get from schema-free um, stores, because you don't define a new schema, you can just read it, update it in memory, store it back to the database, and send it out to the user at the same point in time. So this is one place where you can do the on-the-fly document migration. And of course, many more. How does it look like? So simplest for that application will just define additional REST routes. And then you can implement any code in uh, ExpressJS style um, callbacks. Typically, if you just want to execute a query, you write down the query, probably use some query parameters, execute it, and put it out as a JSON. But this is all JavaScript. You can do arbitrary complicated things there. You should not because it uses the context on the database level. So if you make these things slow, then of course the database will answer slowly. Keep that in mind. <laughs> Demo time. Good. So my database is still running. And here I have an index.js, which is the simplest version to deploy a Fox service. Just a JavaScript file. I can make it more complicated by including a manifest file telling all these so that resources should be included as well. But for the, uh, for the demo purposes, I'm fine with a single J uh, JavaScript file. I have five lines of boilerplate code, including modules and starting the router. And then I can just start with writing the Fox application. And in this case, I'm just adding two new get routes rowing and one using an input parameter. Both of them just executing one of the queries that we had before, um, running them on the database and returning the result. And on this part, I have added documentation, summary description, the response, and the RangyDB uses these fields to generate this Vega documentation, where you can live test out your API. And I've done this two times. The um, difference is that I use the past parameter. If I want to install it, there is a tool called Fox CLI, which I can use or install via npm, which will give me the Fox executable. And I can just say, please, Fox install. At the mount point, avocado, my JavaScript file or my bundle that I have. And off we go. 
install the service. And the Fox tool can do much, much more, which I don't go into details here. So it has a couple of commands that allows you to manage the Fox applications from the command line. So let's go to the services. And here I have installed my Avocado service. As I don't have used the manifest file, uh, I don't have any version in here. And I don't have any readme and stuff. I can add that with the manifest. And if I go to the API documentation, I get the Swagger UI using what I've written down in the description files. And I can just try it out, execute, and it will generate new code example if I want to try it myself. Um, the request URL and will print out the error that, uh, or print out the result that I had. There must be some. Okay, let's let's get all the members of. Where is the input field? Ah, here we go. We'll try it out. So let's get all the members of Team Auto. Um, it's capital G. Execute. And there we go. I get all the members of Team Auto just executing the tree as soon as possible. I think we are running out of time, so I'll speed up a bit. Okay, <laughs> of course, a RenDB is able to, to scale. So we have charting. Um, charting is used for large data sets and write scaling. So the idea is that we add a couple of more machines and distribute the data across them. Um, a collection can be distributed in so-called shards across the servers. So every server is responsible only for a portion of the data, not the entire data set. Can be distributed by user-defined attributes, default by key. Number of shards is immutable, so you give it up front, and you cannot change it for the time being. <coughs> Um, and each collection can have its own number of shards. And of course, if I have nine shards and I put in the tenth machine, it cannot be responsible for one of the shards. Because I can only distribute nine shards on nine machines. Replication is the other aspect of, shard, of uh, scaling. So, sharding is just if you have huge data sets. Replication if you need cluster for high availability. So if your machine fails, which is most likely in the cluster, use replication, which makes sure you have copies of the same data in the cluster. And we have auto failovers so that whenever a machine fails, one of the followers replicas can take over. Of course, the followers do not accept writes. You can only write to the server responsible for the data. Replication is synchronously. And of course, data is placed in different physical machines because otherwise you kind of points. Okay, starting a cluster in a random DB is super complicated. So I would just use mode cluster, here cluster. And I can now or could now state starter dot local, which will run a local cluster. And I will do it for now. So this boots up nine servers now. One agency which keeps is the consistent key value store keeping the configuration. Three database servers holding the data, three coordinators responsible for the queries. And boots up. So we have the agents running, we have the data database servers running. And in a couple of seconds, we will see the coordinators. And there we go. Let's go back to the web interface. Disconnect it because I killed the server. Reconnect now. Uh, I should reload because we get a different UI in the cluster. And here we see we are now running in a clustered environment, having three coordinators, three database servers in total. The API doesn't change too much. So for some queries, we need to know upfront which collections are involved. Um, but most other features are compatible without any changes in the software. If I would not start a local cluster, but a distributed cluster, so running on different machines, one, two, three. there we go. Just give it a different folder and remove the starter local. Then it will actually tell me 
okay, please use these other commands on the different servers, and I just need to exchange the IP address here because I bound it to localhost for some reason. Um, uh, and then um, I can just join running the same command, replacing the IP address, and just go and form a cluster on these three machines. And I can actually uh, execute this command much more often on different servers, and we will thereby increase the cluster automatically. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions. Question about uh, Open API or Swagger. Yes. Can you do it the other way around? Like, not document the existing Express services, but go from the YAML, for example, and create sort of stubs or uh, scaffolding? Yes. Uh, for the time being, I don't think that we can. So okay. we have the, the generate Swagger, but I don't think we have the other way around. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Don't think so. So, as Frank already said, we are an open source project. So, we would like to see some GitHub stars because they always help us get successful and follow us on Twitter, if you like. And thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the food and the evening. Thank you. Woo!